Hello, a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's show, Iraq's second largest city, Tikrit, is still in ruins three years after its liberation from the Islamic State group. The Iran-Israel standoff, the two regional rivals move closer to confrontation in Syria as Iran continues to back powerful militias in the war-ravaged country. Also coming up, trapped between Islamic law and the modern world, Sepida Jandari joins us on the show to talk about the challenges she faces as a female singer in Iran. We start with Syria's Ghouta, which over the past days has been witness to some of the bloodiest scenes in three years. Pro-government forces have been shelling the rebel-held area, killing hundreds of people. This is an apparent preparation for a ground assault on the besieged region. The United Nations, meanwhile, has called for an immediate end to the bombardment. More than six months after Iraq proclaimed the defeat of the Islamic State group, the country is on a path to rebuild. In a conference held in Kuwait earlier this month, some 30 billion U.S. dollars were pledged by international donors to reconstruct the war-torn country. That's only a third of what Baghdad estimates it will need long term. Now, our reporters on the ground take a look at the city, which has now been liberated for years. That's Tikrit, but without any sign for better change. The teaching hospital of Tikrit once served over one and a half million people. Three years after Iraqi forces liberated the town from the Islamic State group, the building remains in tatters. It is a testimony to the unforgiving intensity and astronomical cost of Iraq's latest war. Fighters from the IS group took up positions inside the hospital, so the Iraqi army had to use all means necessary to uproot them from the building. Riyad Jaber is a member of Tikrit's municipal council. His son Omar was born in this hospital. His and many other medical records are now buried under the rubble dusty remnants of life before the war. Just removing all this rubble is going to take a lot of time and it will require a lot of money. Money that the local government does not have. Instead, the United Nations plans to rebuild the hospital. Elsewhere in the city, infrastructure projects have come to a halt. Since the beginning of the war against the IS group, the central government in Baghdad has slashed budget allocations to regional governments. Before the Islamic State group, Tikrit had the potential to be one of Iraq's top cities in terms of economy and tourism. But all of this has now stopped. Three years have gone by since liberation, but life in Tikrit has still not returned to normal. The city, best known as Saddam Hussein's hometown, used to be a busy gateway between North and South Iraq. Today, shops are closed and there is little traffic along its main thoroughfares. <laughs> to build a future, the government will also need to address deep psychological trauma and social rifts left in the wake of the war. Many of these children lived under IS rule and survived the battle that brought about its demise. Safa Ramadan helps them to catch up on years without schooling and to cope with their difficult past. The children have lived through things they shouldn't have experienced. They've seen people being killed in front of their eyes. This generation will struggle to find a positive outlook and will always have some sort of problems. The majority of these displaced children are from the nearby town of Beji, which has been almost entirely destroyed. Our house was destroyed during the fighting, and it hasn't been cleared of mines yet. But I'd prefer to go back rather than stay here. Isn't it better to stay in your own house? There is little hope of returning to Beji soon. Until then, Amar and his family are stuck in makeshift housing in Tikrit. There are families who've nowhere else to live, so this is the best solution they could find. They've set up emergency shelters and live underneath the rubble. Unable to afford rent and with no help from the government, Amar's family had little choice but to move into these ruins, homes destroyed during airstrikes. More than two years after its liberation, the government has done nothing to rebuild the city. The residents of Beji have come to accept that if they want to return, they will have to foot the bill for reconstruction. Nobody has come here to ask us what we need. I've been here for one month. 
or even a month and a half, and nobody has come. We don't even have electricity or water. Donating money without addressing widespread corruption in Iraq's government will not be much use. So says Sheikh Nadal, one of many tribal elders and local politicians who have lost faith in the central government. If donors give the money to the government, we won't benefit at all. They should come here, see the situation with their own eyes and help the people directly. Iraq is one of the richest countries in the world, but as long as you have leaders like ours, the people will remain poor. We never receive anything. The war against the IS group allowed the government to rally popular support while turning a blind eye to its own failures. Now that the terror group has officially been defeated, the government must address its shortcomings to lead Iraq towards a better future. It's not quite a declaration of war, but the threats are getting increasingly vocal. Israel has said it's prepared to take on Iran and Hezbollah in the ongoing Syrian conflict. For Tehran, this is yet another war of words, with Tel Aviv using aggression as a policy against its neighbors. Speaking at the Munich Security Conference, Benjamin Netanyahu repeated once again, Iran is the greatest threat the world faces. For several minutes, the Prime Minister attacked Tehran before finally brandishing a piece of scorched metal, which he says belongs to an Iranian drone, downed last week in Israel. Mr. Zarif, do you recognize this? You should. It's yours. You can take back with you a message to the tyrants of Tehran. Do not test Israel's resolve. For Iran's foreign minister, this was all theatrics. Admittedly, it's not the first time Netanyahu brings props to a speech. Here at the United Nations, he held up a drawing of a bomb to symbolize Iran's nuclear program. This time, it's over Syria that the confrontation between Israel and Iran has escalated. In response to the drone launch, the Israeli Air Force destroyed the base from which the craft was allegedly launched in Syria. But during the offensive, an F-16 was shot down, a first since 1982, which proves, according to Tehran, that Israel is not invincible. Israel uses aggression as a, as a policy. And once somebody has, the Syrians have the guts to, uh, to down one of its planes, it's as if a disaster has happened. The conflict in Syria has already drawn in Russian, American, Iranian, Turkish and Kurdish forces, each with their own interests and priorities. Many observers fear that an Israeli entry would only prolong the war even further. For the next segment of the show, we're crossing to Tehran to speak to Safide Jandari, a singer with 12 years of training in traditional Iranian music. Now, despite getting thousands of followers on social media, Safide feels her career has hit a dead end. That's because Iranian women have been banned from singing or playing musical instruments solo since the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Let's now listen to a clip of Safide's music. <laughs> Safide Jandaria, thank you so much for speaking to Middle East Matters. Now, tell us about the challenges that you face as a female singer in Iran. The biggest problem that we have is our status. As women vocalists, we're not officially recognized here. Legally, we cannot be active. We cannot release music albums, albums that could be sold in shops. So this prevents musicians from working with us. If they decide to work with us, it is us, the singers, that have to take on all the costs that go into producing an album. 
انجام بشه مثل هزینه آهنگسازی هزینه نوازنده هزینه استودیو همه رو So that's fees for the musicians, for production, the studio. As a result of this, we don't end up making any money. The other issue is that we can't put on a solo concert. If we do want to put on a solo concert, we can only perform in front of an all-female audience. And these gigs have problems of their own. But it does seem that you've found a way around these uh, restrictions to get your music to the public using really popular apps in Iran like Instagram and Telegram. Tell us about that. Apps like Telegram and Instagram have provided the opportunity for us to make our music available to the public and to become better known. But this doesn't help us professionally. All we can do is introduce ourselves and become accessible. We also get a lot of energy and inspiration from their positive comments on social media. And that in itself is great. What about performing abroad? Is that an option? Performing abroad has its own problems. One of them is applying for a visa, not just for ourselves, but for the entire band. That can be problematic. We may only be able to take a small group of musicians of us. We would also need sponsorship. And unless we are very well known, there is no way we could get sponsored. You've been talking about certain restrictions when it comes to your own profession. How have things generally changed for women under President Rouhani, who came along and he promised very much cultural and social reforms, especially for women? I haven't seen real change. I mean, it's not much different to the previous administrations. It is what it used to be. What do you think of the recent hijab movement, if that's what you can call it, in Iran? The freedom to choose what we wear is one of our basic rights in any country. Being able to choose what we put on, that would mean respecting each individual to make their own decision. The dress code that we have here creates restrictions for women. On many occasions, women have been insulted, treated badly, and at times there has even been physical confrontation. So that's why you're seeing these recent events. Sepide Jandari, thank you so much for joining us all the way from the Iranian capital. That's it for this edition of uh, Middle East Matters. Don't forget you can get our latest news on both Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching.